Thank you uh, so much for being here today. I'm very honored to receive this award um, in front of all of you here in Croatia. It's my first time to Croatia, so it was a good excuse to come across to Europe and to see this lovely country. And uh, I'm sorry for the feedback, but I'm going to try and move around as much as possible so it doesn't happen. Um, so thank you. It's, it's great to be here. And today what I'm going to do is, uh, although I could present uh, work that's already published um, on which I think this award is based, I'm actually going to present new stuff. Um, and so firstly, before I go ahead with any kind of research, I would have not had this award, been able to uh, receive this award without the uh, wonderful students and postdocs who have helped me along the past uh, nearly six years uh, since I've been an assistant professor at Princeton. And so today, um, I'm actually going to be presenting work by someone called Blake Yang, who's here looking very serious in his uh, lab glasses. Uh, but there's been a whole lot of work done by the other students and postdocs, which uh, has really helped me catalyze my career during the early stages and, and hopefully will help me um, as I move forward throughout the decades. Um, it's also going to thanking my uh, PhD advisors who helped catalyze, uh, well, to help me in this research area to begin with and help develop my research skills, and then also my postdoc mentors at Los Alamos National Lab. So to give an overview of what uh, my group focuses on, we're really looking at uh, what's going on in concrete materials at the sub-micron length scale. Uh, so I fully understand that concrete is a very heterogeneous material, and especially so if you put uh, reinforcement in there. But there's still some stuff that we don't understand at very small length scales that contributes to macroscopic behaviour. And this is even more the case when we're changing chemistries of concrete to try and make new or more sustainable types of concrete, where we're actually changing the structure and, the, well, the chemistry and the structure of the main binder phase that holds everything together, um, which in Portland cement concrete is calcium silicate hydrate gel. So we've really in my group been focusing on what's going on at the submicron length scale using a whole range of techniques, both experiments and simulations. Um, and these are just, excuse me. These include uh, atomistic simulations and atomistic-based simu uh, experimental techniques, um, and also looking at uh, what the pore structure of these cement materials is like at the submicron length scale. Both other experimental techniques out there that we can characterize what this pore structure is and how it evolves with time. And then also, can we actually develop simulation methods that are validated by the experiments uh, so that we can predict new pore structures or predict the pore structures that develop in new systems without having to wait for the experimental data. And I must say that this kind of area, I feel that is extremely important when we're going to new chemistries, uh, new types of, of cements, whether it be using supplementary cementitious materials in Portland cement concrete or whether it's changing the chemistries to look at uh, other materials such as alkali activated materials or super sulfated cements or calcium sulfoaluminate cements. And so today, though, I'm really going to focus on the very, very fine length scale. And I'm going to focus on the formation of the main binder gel that holds everything together in concrete, which is calcium silicate hydrate gel. And also, if you change the chemistry of this gel, how does it change the formation? And it would be fantastic if we could understand this formation process using experiments. Because then we know exactly what would be occurring and what happens when you change the chemistry. But unfortunately, there is no experimental techniques out there to really look at the very early stages of the formation of calcium silicate hydrate gel or related gel systems. Um, I must say there's been a tremendous amount of work that has been performed over recent decades on the formation of calcium silicate hydrate gel, especially once nucleation has occurred, how then the gel precipitates out, and what kind of growth mechanisms does it have, and how the gel, which is in a solid form, interacts with the solution environment around it. However, we do not have a complete understanding of CSH gel formation, um, and especially what happens during the really initial stages of when this gel forms, because we're really looking at dissolved species in solution, things such as calcium silicates 
water molecules in there. And it's how those species interact that is going to help dictate how the gel precipitates, at what time it precipitates, um, setting processes, all of this. And so you might say, well, we've been using Portland cement concrete for a very long time. We know how it sets. We know um, how, what kind of reaction kinetics this material has. And so there, therefore, why are, we, why are we caring about this really kind of minute detail scientific information? Well, my argument is, as we are trying to make more sustainable concrete, we are changing chemistries. And we are changing chemistries, potentially in unknown ways, in terms of how it's going to affect um, the short-term properties of the concrete and also the long-term performance. And it would be great if we could analyse this all experimentally. But for some of the new te technologies out there, we can't wait 50 to 100 years to get all this empirical evidence so that we can use them. And so there's a role that um, material science plays in helping to predict material performance based on the real fundamental knowledge. So uh, today what I'm going to be talking about is this calcium silicate hydrate gel. It is the main strength giving phase in concrete and it's also porous and the pore structure of the material is very important. So firstly, what I'm going to talk about is the formation and then secondly, I'm going to talk about how we can model the evolution of the pore structure, but just to do with this calcium silicate hydrate gel. And so for those of you who aren't used to talking about the molecular level of what goes on in concrete systems, I just have a schematic here. Um, well, it's on my left and my right. You just pick which one you want to look at. But it's a schematic, a very, a very uh, kind of brief schematic of what CSH gel looks like. But it has some um, differences to how it would actually look like in reality. So this is showing uh, finite chain lengths of silicate units, which are in the blue triangles. You have a calcium oxide layer, which is the or orange circles. And then in between these, these sheets that we have set up, we also have calcium in the interlayer spacing. Um, and so we really want to understand, based on what species exist in solution, how much they really want to, uh, these species want to react and form bonds. Because this is going to help us understand what kind of um, properties, well, what kind of aspects of this structure wants to form first. And so when it, um, what I'm going to talk about today is really the calcium silicate hydrate gel, the cash gel that has alumina in it as well, and also uh, sodium containing cash gel. Um, and as we move to changing the, the composition of the gel, that's where our level of understanding of these material decreases. Um, so we have these gels in Portland cement systems, but then there's also similar types of gels that exist in alkali activated concrete. So if you look at making an alkali activated concrete, you're taking um, byproducts from other industries such as fly ash or blast furnace slag. Um, but also uh, calcine clays is a very um, abundant option in terms of precursors for alkali activated materials. And depending on the chemistry of the precursor, then you either end up with binder chemistries that look like this canash gel, where it's a cash calcium aluminosilicate hydrate, but there's some sodium in there as well. Or if you have a low calcium system, you tend to end up with what's known as a NASH gel if you've got sodium, so a, a sodium aluminosilicate hydrate gel. Um, and so the, the work that I'm going to show today relates both to Portland cement systems and to these high calcium uh, canash gels as well. So what we're going to do, well, what I'm going to show you today is um, some of the research that is yet to be published where we've been focusing on the very early stages of CSH um, formation prior to emergence of the solid CSH when you mix, say, Portland cement with uh, water. And also keep in mind that I'm just talking about CSH, but there are multiple other kinds of phases that precipitate out in Portland cement systems. And in alkali activated materials, there are also secondary hydration products that form as well. So because we can't look at this experimentally, we're using uh, density functional theory calculations, which is based on Schrodinger's equation. And so what we're trying to do is say, OK, we have atoms in a simulation. How do these atoms want to react? And then we can calculate the thermodynamics of that system. So specifically what we're calculating here is for a given um, cluster of atoms, such as uh, the one on the left here, the calcium monohydroxide reactant one, what is the energy of that system, not just in terms of total energy, but we can also calculate its Gibbs free energy. And so if we model um, that reactant and a second reactant being the same thing, 
and then we model in one whole system how these reactants want to interact. We can calculate energies for each of these um, situations. And then the Gibbs free energy of reaction is just this simple um, term here where we're taking away the Gibbs free energy of the reactants, subtracting the Gibbs free energy of the reactants from the Gibbs free energy of the products, and we get the Gibbs free energy of the reaction. And so what we're looking at is to dissolve species, how much they want to interact and how strongly they interact in terms of the Gibbs free energy. And just so that you can follow along in terms of the results that I'm going to show, a negative value for the Gibbs free energy means that that reaction wants to occur. It's a spontaneous reaction. If there's a positive value, it means that those two reactants don't want to interact. They don't want to bond with each other. And so we're going to look at CSH, cash gel, and then canash gel as well and hopefully get an understanding of how the gels want to precipitate out, what types of bonds form first, and how those types of bonds are affected by different chemistries. And so the other thing we should take into account is that we need to take to look at the solution environment in which these uh, dissolved species exist. Um, and so what we have here is either a pH of 12.5 for Portland cement systems, um, we've done a pH of 14 for the alkali activated materials, which is on the higher side, and people are really trying to reduce that pH level to make them less caustic for making alkali activated materials, but we just use 14 here. And we have to take into account that for a given element, such as calcium, there may be one, more than one type of dissolved species that exist in solution. So that's what's shown up here. We've got three calcium species, two aluminate species, and we've got a range of silicate species as well, where there's different deprotonation states depending on the pH of the system. Um, so the last thing I want to say before I show some results is we also need to take into account that we have dissolved species, which means that we need to look at the fact that the, we need to put explicit water molecules into our simulations. Because it has been shown that if you don't put these explicit water molecules into the simulations, you're not getting very accurate results in terms of the Gibbs free energies. And so therefore, this is an area of research itself when it comes to how do we use uh, quantum mechanics to model uh, solution species and how do we then work out the number of water molecules, explicit ones, that we need to put in the simulations. And I'm not going to go into much detail here, but just to say that it's not a straightforward process. And my students spent a lot of time looking at different ways to work out these number of water molecules. And really what you're trying to do is, um, for a given number of water molecules, find the minimum solvation free energy. Um, and to do that, we have to go around the thermodynamic cycle because we can't go directly from the top left to the bottom left here. So now that we know that we can do all of these simulations, we've got all of the results, then I can show you what's going on in these systems. So this is the early stages of CSH formation. And at a pH of about 12.5, we have a calcium 2 plus species existing and a calcium monohydroxide. For the silicates, we have a neutral silicate species, singly deprotonated silicate, and also a doubly deprotonated silicate. And now we're looking at the interactions between all of these species in solution. And so that's what's shown here up on the table. So the two types of interact, well, three types of interactions we have are calcium calcium, calcium silicate, and then silicate silicate. And so they've been color coded in this table, where blue is the calcium calcium interactions. Yellow is the calcium silicates, and the orange is the silicate silicate. And so what I want you to notice here is I've bolded, I've put in bold the, the most um, negative values for each classification we're looking at. And so the most negative value on this table is between calcium calcium species. And so that's indicating that calcium calcium bonds or interactions are going to form first. Um, and then the next most prevalent or the me next most negative value is actually between calcium and silicate species. And then there is quite a strong silicate silicate interaction as well, which is the minus 48 here. Okay, so the first one is in the blue, the second one's turning up in the yellow, and the third one's turning up in the orange color. However, keep in mind that we don't really have any neutral silicate species floating around at a pH of 12.5. There's only trace amounts. So we can't look at those neutral silicate columns and the row. So they've been grayed out. And now what you see is it's a relatively mild interaction between the silicate silicates that's at all favorable. 
So based on these interaction parameters, this is what we think is occurring during the very initial stages of CSH formation. We think what's happening first is you're forming that calcium oxide layer, okay? Um, you might not form the full layer, you might just form a couple of interactions, but at the same time what is happening is that calcium and silicate are very strongly interacting as well. So what's shown here is calcium, calcium wants to interact, the, the orange dots, but at the same time, calcium is pulling silicates into the structure. Um, the third most favorable, well, it's the silicate silicate interactions that aren't very strong, and so they just kind of come along for the ride. This silicate chain that forms is not because the silicate ch chain forms in the first place, it's most likely that calcium is dictating the formation of the CSH gel. So this is CSH gel. We've got an idea that maybe this is the case. Maybe we're forming the calcium oxide motifs first where the silicates are being pulled in by strong iron pairing between calcium and silicates. And then the silicate chains are just a secondary formation process. Um, but there's a couple of things that I have not mentioned yet that we do need to take into account, a couple of caveats. The first thing is I have not taken into account, we have not taken into account the importance of kinetics of reaction, okay? So when we look at um, entities wanting to react to form um, bonds, there's an activation barrier associated with those interactions. And that can dictate how strongly certain reactions want to um, occur. And so that really needs to be explored to see if there's really high activation barriers for certain things like the calcium-calcium interaction. If there's a very high in activation barrier, that's going to mean that it's very hard for those calcium-calcium interactions to occur. And why we care about these activation barriers is because they are controlling the reaction rates, the kinetics. They do contribute. And also, we need to take into account the relative amount of different dissolved species in the solution. So what I was saying is that the strongest interaction wants to occur between a calcium and a calcium. However, the two calciums that interact, if I go back here, there's only one that's actually favourable and it's between two calcium monohydroxides. If you look at the other calcium-calcium interactions, they're very strongly uh, positive, which means those reactions aren't spontaneous at all. And so if we've used up all the calcium mono, uh, monohydroxide species through forming these initial calcium-calcium um, interactions, if they're not replenished very quickly um, in the solution, then those calcium-calcium interactions are not wanting to occur. The only other thing that I should mention as well is all of these calculations are based off, on just two dissolved species wanting to interact but we know in reality there's a lot more that goes on in terms of complex interactions and solution. And so this is just a really first attempt at trying to look at these really early, early age formation kinetics. Well, sorry, formation reactions, not at the kinetics, but using the thermodynamics. So let's look at now, we're going from um, calcium silicate hydrate gel to cash gel, where we're looking at the impact of um, aluminium in this system. And so all that's new in this table is the right-hand column where we now have the aluminium interactions occurring as well. So calcium to aluminium and the, well, to the alumina and calcium to the silicate species as well. And so what we see here is there's quite a strong um, pairing between calcium and aluminate species in addition to what we see between calcium and silicate species. And so this is indicating how aluminates are pulled into the structure of the cash gel. They're quite strongly interacting with the calcium, and so therefore they are pulled in at somewhat of a similar uh, propensity, a strength, um, compared to how silicates pulled in, into the structure as well. Um, the only thing we haven't looked at here is it's very well known that um, aluminates sit on the bridging site within this structure, which is where these purple triangles are sitting. These are the aluminate species. Um, but what could be happening initially is that the aluminate ends up on a paired site, not a bridging site. And therefore, there's going to have to be some kind of exchange process that occurs between the silicate and the aluminate to make sure that the aluminate ends up on the bridging site. And this is something that could be further explored using these density functional theory calculations. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to these calculations is the impact of sodium. And so we have changed slightly in terms of what species exist in solution. There's no more the calcium 2 plus, 
We now we've got calcium monohydroxide and calcium with two hydroxides. And now with the silicate and aluminate species, we have charge balancing sodium cations. Uh, so this is changing somewhat the interactions that we find in terms of their strengths. And I'm actually now comparing the top line, well, the top table being for uh, the CSH formation and the cash formation, those values. And the bottom table is now with the presence of sodium. And so some important things that we see here is that all of the calcium-calcium interactions at the high pH with sodium in there are all favorable, which was not the case for a pH of 12.5. Um, so there's even stronger driving forces for the calcium-calcium interactions to occur. And then if you look at the calcium silicate interactions, I've highlighted the two rows that are equivalent, but the only difference is sodium is present in one and not the other. And so what we see here is sodium is actually are reducing the strength of interactions between calcium and silicates, but they're actually strengthening the interactions between calcium and aluminates. And so this is actually being seen experimentally in terms of the, the final kind of gel that precipitates out um, in a cash system, calcium aluminosilicate hydrate system, with and without sodium. When you have sodium, you can actually pull, pull more aluminium into the structure compared to if you didn't have the sodium there in the first place. And so we're actually seeing just from these computational simulations as to why more aluminium can be pulled in is because it more strongly wants to interact with the calcium. The other thing that I want to mention here is that if you look at the silicate, silicate and silicate aluminate interactions and the impact of the sodium on these interactions, you can see that the overall magnitude of the values decrease. Sometimes one changes from positive to negative or negative to positive, but the overall magnitude decreases, which means that these interactions are weakening in the presence of the sodium. Now, what we think is occurring during Kanash gel formation is that it is kind of similar to CSH formation in the first place. But uh, the main difference is that the sodium is causing alumina to be more strongly pulled into the structure so you end up with a higher concentration of aluminium in your gel. And so there's going to be, uh, there's going to be uh, ramifications of this and, and in terms of uh, potential benefits from having an, uh, more alumina in your structure, which people have seen experimentally. So for this, um, I've got a little bit of a section to go, but in terms of looking at these uh, animistic simulations, we've found just through the DFT calculations, that calcium is dominating the very early stages of the gel formation in CSH, which is Portland cement systems, cash gel, which is Portland cement systems, when you have a supplementary cementitious material in there that is rich in alumina, and also in the canash gel, which is what tends to form in a high calcium alkali activated material, and may also be occurring in Portland cement systems where now people have supplementary cementitious materials such as ground recycled glass, which has quite a lot of alkalis in there as well. Now, what we also see is that the silicate chain formation in these gels is a secondary process. It's not, not the driving force for the, the material to form, it's just coming along for the ride. Now, in general, we've also found that the silicate-silicate interactions and silicate-illuminate interactions are relatively weak, which, um, even in the presence of sodium, which might have implications for looking at, say, low calcium alkali activated materials, because if they have uh, weaker kind of interactions compared to Portland cement systems, then this might have implications for long-term performance of the alkali, low calcium alkali activated materials. But then that enhances the ability to strengthen these kind of systems if we're going to start manipulating with the chemistry, which we can look at using these types of calculations. So in the last couple of minutes, I do want to talk about some other ongoing work that's been happening in my group, where we've been looking at the pore structure of uh, the cement pastes. And specifically, we're looking at the pore structure of alkali activated materials. It is true that if you look at a concrete system, a heterogeneous system, then uh, if you're getting cracking in your concrete, then you're going to get accelerated uh, degradation occurring because of those highways in which aggressive chemicals can get to, say, your reinforced, reinforcing steel. But it's also important that we understand the permeability 
of the, the matrix that's holding everything together, whether it be uh, Portland cement-based matrix with calcium silicate hydrate gel in there, or whether it be some of these other gels that, it, that is in alternative cements. So we can analyze the pore structure of these matrices quite well experimentally, but we don't actually understand what's governing the uh, type of uh, pore structure that evolves. We don't understand the physics, the chemistry behind what we see experimentally. So for instance, we don't understand the mechanisms that control the formation and evolution of pores, whether it be really small gel pores, which are about two to five nanometers in size, or capillary pores that are found at a larger length scale above about 10 nanometers. And although we know that these gel pores emerge in, say, calcium silicate hydrate systems, Portland cements, or high calcium alkali activated materials, we, we do not understand what controls and stabilizes their size. So we end up with these really small pores, two to five nanometers in size, but why aren't we getting coalescing of these pores together that forms larger pore systems? Because if you look at a microstructure kind of understanding, we know that there's this morphology coarsening that tends to occur in a whole range of materials, where you go from really small entities to uh, larger size things over time, just due to the fact that that's how the systems want to evolve. And so um, stuff that we haven't published yet, this is some other uh, uh, research that we've been working on, is we want to actually be able to simulate the evolution of the pore structure in alkali activated materials, and potentially in the future, CSH type systems as well. And so I'm, I don't have time to go into the details, but uh, what we are doing is a coarse-grained approach where the interactions between the species for coarse-grained come from identity functional theory calculations. We use Monte Carlo to simulate the evolution of the, the, the coarse-grained um, system. And at the end, we can actually calculate the pore size distribution of our simulation. So what space is not taken up by silicate and aluminate in this system? And so what we find here is here's a simulated pore uh, size distribution for three different types of alkali activated metacalin where we have um, a system with no silica in the activator to begin with, a system with a moderate amount of activator in the, uh, a moderate amount of silicate in the activator, and then a system with a high amount. So that's the blue, orange, and green. And what we see is what we know experimentally is things tend to shift to smaller sizes as you bump up the silica in the activating solution. But that's been seen experimentally, so that's um, not really that new. But the thing that's new is we've now been combining this with very careful nitrogen sorption analysis, where we're trying to look at what's called the micropores in the uh, material, which is the pores that are smaller than about five nanometers in size. And so what we have here for the hydroxide activated metacalin is our simulation results, once again, it's in blue. But now we've got experimental results in purple. So the first thing we notice is there's a massive peak in the purple that's actually associated with the nanopores in a zeolite, because our system has actually crystallized um, prior to the measurement. But also what we don't see is any of these other pores turning up where we see in the simulations. So this potentially could indicate that we've got a closed pore network in our alkali activated metacalin that we don't see experimentally because the nitrogen can't actually um, get at that pore network. And people have reported seeing this kind of closed pore network um, using transmission electron microscopy in the past. So this is promising results. But we can't forget about the larger pores that exist in cement-based materials. So some more experimental results. What we see here is the impact of the activator, whether it has silica in the activator or not, and the pore size distribution in what's known as the mesopore region. And so what you see here is you tend to be around 10 nanometers or so in size, um, which has also been reported for the uh, alkali activated metacalin, but it's really important also to not forget about larger pore sizes. And so here, using mercury intrusion porosymmetry, what you find is that for the hydroxide activated samples that had these nanopores associated with the zeolites and quite small pores in what's known as the mesopore region, they still have very large pores in the hundreds of nanometers range. And so all of these pores together, well, the largest pores that make up the percolating network, they're the ones that are going to control permeability of your material. So that's just a little bit of an update in terms of some of the simulations we've been doing in terms of pore structure and how we're trying to predict what pore structure evolves depending on the chemistry of the material. 
So in conclusion, what I've showed today um, is some of the more recent work that's come out of my group, uh, where we've been looking at the early stages of gel formation in different types of cement systems, and we found that it's very strongly controlled by the calcium species in solution. We've also found that sodium enhances the uptake of the aluminium into the gel, um, which is why we see experimentally that we have more alumina in, uh, say, high calcium alkali beta materials compared to other systems um, in terms of the gel. Now, these types of atomistic simulations may not be so relevant for those systems such as Portland cement concrete that have been around for um, 50, 100, 100 of years, where there's a lot of empirical evidence on how they perform. But as we move towards um, new and emerging types of cements, we really need to better understand how they can perform long term. And I would argue there's a, a key role of, of simulations to play here to help us be able to then predict long term performance, to help us, um, well, help inform us about what kind of standards might be good to use, all of this kind of stuff. So. Um, I've also shown that um, it's difficult to predict the pore structure that evolves in the type of materials, but we're starting to work on that. And so with that, I thank you for your time. Um, I hope you enjoy your coffee. I want to thank all these funding agencies, and um, thank you. <laughs>